Welcome back to another episode of Tariko Unveiled. After the three disciples, I'm sure everyone thinks what else could possibly sate this endless hunger. Today, we'll be talking about a man that has always been directly beside our chill for protagonist Tariko, sometimes as enemy, but ultimately as family. Enter sous chef Starjuin. Starjuin is one of the driving antagonists from the first few arcs of the Tariko series, and is in fact the second in command and strongest member of the Gourmet Corps, aside from Adora himself. Starjuin, like many Tariko characters, is a massive man, coming in around Zebra's height and built on comparison to Tariko. We're first introduced to Starjuin in the form of a GT robot, mechanical avatars featured in Tariko. During their first meeting, a simple acknowledgement from Starjuin sent Tariko and Coco to unleash their power and prepare for a deadly battle. This will be far from the last time, however. Starjuin is shown in the Regal Mammoth arc as the central antagonist. While still in a GT robot, Starjuin could only represent a fraction of his power, and still in this arc, he decimates Tariko. And only after eating the jewel meat and leveling up did Tariko have the strength to defeat the robot, which was still not Starjuin himself. And at this point in the story, Starjuin was very easily capable of entering the gourmet world. Now, things start to get a tad bit more interesting. In their first person-to-person -person meeting, Starjuin states that it took Tariko approximately 0.5 seconds to become battle-ready, and in that 0.5 seconds, Starjuin could have killed him 10 times. This being Tariko before entering the gourmet world, this statement is backed up in earlier episodes and chapters, as Starjuin states the 1 1,000 second delay drastically reduced his speed in the GT robot. That's a millisecond. The human brain takes dozens of milliseconds to even receive information from the eyes, and an estimated 120 milliseconds to even begin to take actions based on that information. Essentially, a human being is always lagging behind the information that our brains perceive not to overload us. Starjuin, taking it in the same leap forward, has a reaction of visual processing on the level of future sight. His gourmet cell demon takes the form of a massive, pointy-eared cyclops. True to the nature of his third eye, this eye will not lose track of its target allowing Starjuin to always see his opponent in real time despite any illusion or technique. His gourmet cells also allow him the ability to create powerful blue flames that can burn or melt anything that they come in contact with. With this ability, he is capable of generating, controlling, and dishing out heat surpassing 2800 degrees. He is also capable of freely controlling his own body temperature, which is higher than a normal human's and can set his whole body or parts of it on fire. And he is even immune to the flames and heat that he generates. In combat, Starjuin is an incredibly versatile fighter, utilizing his blue flames to create barriers, shields, and even domes to prevent enemy escape. He wields a unique knife that seems more of a sword, known as the Burner Knife, a weapon made to cook and cut ingredients at the same time, enhancing his firepower even more by giving it a direct focus point. During the Gourmet Festival arc, Starjuin shows the ability and quickness he has to neutralize and bypass all of the four king's defense measures placed around Kamatsu. And also during the festival, Starjuin took the full force of every single one of Tariko's opening attacks, these coming in the form of multiple high number Kuji punches and even the leg variants of those moves. These moves capable of destroying mountains sent Starjuin miles from their original battle site, leaving only minor damage and breaking his mask. Proceeding into the battle, Starjuin was not only capable of dodging techniques enhanced by the ultimate routine, but also attacking and executing attacks faster than even Tariko could. He took numerous blows to his vitals and even his head, along with the entire full course of Tariko's abilities, which at the time, Tariko was gourmet world capable of having master food immersion and everything of the likes. This battle ended with Tariko decimated, having lost an arm and a leg and several chunks of his body and with Komatsu being kidnapped. Moving on into the gourmet world arc, Starjuin and Tariko directly fought the Wolf King Guinness and forced a literal god to dodge, something it hadn't done in thousands of years. This attack scarred the entire planet. He directly battled Joey and had the upper hand during the majority of the battle never so much as being touched, something the other three Heavenly Kings couldn't even remotely manage, and Joey states that 0.1 seconds to them feels like time is standing still, and Starjuin can still track beings like Joey with his third eye because this eye will not lose track of its target, allowing Starjuin to always see his opponent in real time. He was one of the three to stand against Akasha in their final battle, being able to keep track and even avoid Akasha's attacks, except one, saving Toriko. Starjuin loses the majority of his body and is saved for a time by Medora's knocking. It is here we learn that Starjuin was actually Toriko's older brother, 
the both of them being Frozen and Akashi as children that Frozen had hidden away. Though, I kind of think Medora may have had something to do with that. But either way, she hid them away hundreds of years ago, set adrift within a contained back channel. Of the twins, Starjuin being born first is Tariko's long lost true older brother. Along with this basically confirming Tariko is the child of two reincarnated gourmet gods, which makes sense how he could hold three appetite demons. And also Tariko's hair is blue, but was originally black, and that is due to the presence of the blue ogre, while the scars on his face are indicator of the red ogre's presence. But even to his death, Starjuin always said what was needed and nothing more, silently watching and checking on his younger brother the entire series. Even in their brutal battle during the gourmet cooking arc, Starjuin clearly outclassed Tariko and could have killed him several times over. During the Regal Mammoth arc, we can recall Starjuin turned off the pain inhibitors of the GT robot to feel the full force of Tariko's blows. And we could even travel back to the beginning in the Pufferwell Caves, where a general look of acknowledgement forced Tariko to display his true power. Truly, Starjuin was always checking in on his younger brother, and albeit violent ways. This is just another reason why I love the Tarikoverse. The scale of continuity and world building does make me want to petition for a reboot by a better studio or something. Today we're gonna get your skin crawling and talk about a specific bug user. But before, leave a like on the video and show me your appetite. In anime and many popular fiction, we have infinite variations of powers, but one that specifically stands out is insect manipulation. Long in humanity's memory, bugs have dwelled hundreds of trillions of various species throughout the planet, and the real life example of this comes into the fact that even ants actually make up roughly 20% of Earth's animal biomass. There's various characters throughout anime like Shino from Naruto, Maraku from Inuyasha, Clancy from Ben 10, or Koji from My Hero Academy. Characters that can tap into this ability actually possess droves of these creepy crawlies and can overwhelm opponents, shield themselves from catastrophic attacks, and even plan and lay strategy with these bugs. But there's a drawback. Traditional insect users aren't keen to physical combat, and our guest today is no exception, well, until he gets mad. Say hello to sous chef Tommy Rod, perhaps the strongest insect user in all of fiction, and I'll explain why. Tommy Rod might look like he's a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure character with a uniform reminiscent of a polka dotted stag beetle, but as sous chef of the gourmet corps, Tommy Rod is an incredibly capable fighter with jurisdiction and ruthless authority over those beneath him. First appearing in the Ice Hell arc of Tariko, Tommy Rod is introduced as a literal apex predator. When Tariko and his group first made landfall in Ice Hell, a continent where temperatures dropped well below freezing, they encountered the Tundra a beast said to be the gate guardian of Ice Hell, dead, frozen actually, and inside it just, you know, casually hibernating was Seuss Chef Tommy Rod. This would be the first hint of his actual power level as Ice Hell is a place where your breath freezes instantly when you exhale, where large shards of glass the size of arms are thrown simply by the wind, and lastly a place where even in thermal gear, people literally freeze while walking. Tommy Rod can casually stroll about Ice Hell with an almost clear immunity to the cold, and it's never explained, but I imagine he had already figured out environmental adaptation with his gourmet cells like most Tariko characters would have to do later in the gourmet world. Even Tariko was on guard after seeing the dead Tundra Dragon, knowing that something much, much worse lurked out in the snow. Unlike your usual insect summoners, Tommy Rod does not simply attract the native bugs or insects to him. He quite literally bursts them. And I mean that in the most grotesque way possible, well, the grossest way would involve butt stuff, but we're not gonna get into that. Tommy Rods is an incredibly unique biological specimen. He can store, at the time of Ice Hill, 10,000 insect eggs of varying capture levels and launch them out for specific purposes. The insects obey his every will as if they are extensions of him, so you can think of them as his children that he most definitely neglect. Now in terms of these insects' power, we'll start with the first ones he's shown to summon each having capture levels over 30, with 39, 35, 37, and 40. And we need to take heed to understand exactly what capture levels mean. I stated in my previous video that creatures like the Troll Kongs at capture level 9 can fend off armored tanks and highly trained soldiers. The Devil Snake Tariko fought in the Pufferwell Caves came in around level 25 and is literally dwarfed by the creatures Tommy Rod summons on his first showing. The Regal Mammoth, a literal kaiju, a creature with city-like sized mazes within it, and the adult was only measured at a capture level 48. The use of his bugs come literally like a toolbox as well. Aside from obviously extremely predatory and violent species, Tommy Rod also has bugs that expand his own utility. 
starting with demolition style bugs known as bomb bugs, who even with a low capture level are activated by his spark cricket, which acts as a remote detonator for the bombs, and these explosions are capable of collapsing the foundational pillars of Ice Hell. He can produce swarms of massive drill-like beetles that move fast enough to severely injure several trained gourmet hunters, and even dodge and injure Toriko. And he can also seemingly detect when these bugs engage in combat, almost omnipotently, as he can call them back to him telepathically. And he is also capable of sending after people like attack hounds, Keep that in mind, as Tommy Rod has openly stated that he only uses his bugs because he despises having to crush trash with his own hands. Despite that, the first time he met Toriko, he hugged him and stabbed him in the abdomen. Before further commencing the slaughter of Kamatsu's formerly unorphaned penguin, as per his sadistic personality, they were being too loud. And ironically, Tommy Rod also made the statement that they call him Tommy Rod, so there's a chance that his true name is actually unknown, could just be Tommy. Now, outside of the GT robot skirmish with Starjuin, and the play fight that Toriko had had with Grimpotch, his battle with Tommy Rod was actually his first showing of a true one-on-one -on -one fight with a gourmet vice chef. And Tommy Rod unleashed a massive display of power feats throughout the even just start of this arc. He killed the Tundra Dragon, a creature with a capture level higher than the Regal Mammoth. His bomb bug shattered entire sections of the Ice Hill continent, and getting into the battle, he stopped Toriko's tenfold spike punch which earlier in the arc shattered a titanic sized piece of ice. Also in this battle, Tommy Rod displayed that he can launch the bug eggs after heating them up within his own body, essentially firing miniature bombs. These bombs so powerful they can quite literally take the limbs off a heavenly king like Toriko. And the real unique thing about Tommy Rod is his biology, and I'm gonna talk about this several times throughout the video. His biology being akin to a literal human bug. Tommy has compound eyes, infinitely stronger than that of any insect. With a literal million lensed eye, he can see and respond to microscopic levels of movement and even detect changes in the electromagnetic spectrum. So basically, to give you a fair comparison, we'll compare it to the world's apex bug known as the dragonfly. Dragonflies are kind of near perfect having not having to have evolved for millions of years. Their compound eyes contain 30,000 facets, or individual lenses, which for them is like having 10,000 eyes backed up by another 30,000 photoreceptors. They can see in full 360 and detect spectrums of light that no other creature can. And quickly, let me explain this line of insect biology. Most insects have compound eyes, which are curved arrays of microscopic lenses. Each tiny lens captures an individual image to paint an overall picture for the insect. This is why when you go to swat that pest fly, it suddenly has the sharring on. Now on this same note, Tommy Rod's eyes are made of one million different lenses. This by itself puts his perception at an incomprehensible level, making me wonder how fast are the battles in Toriko because he clearly does get hit. Once serious, Tommy Rod gets into battle and he stops using his insects and he bears his fangs, literally. Massive fangs on the foe like, sorta like a vampire, and these are sharp enough to take chunks out of Toriko. Tommy Yod's reactions were on par, if not surpassing Toriko's in their first encounter, and at this point in the battle already having had taken several Kuji punches. He also had already laid claim to Toriko's arm, and this is the first time afterwards that Toriko witnesses his true power as Tommy Rod removes his restraints. At full power, Tommy Rod's size dwarfs Toriko, and he absolutely blitzes the one on Heavenly King. This not necessarily being a power up, but more of a case of power limiting, meaning before even fighting at full strength, he took one of Toriko's arms and severely damaged him. In this I'll call Berserker state, Tommy Rod absolutely bodies Toriko up until Toriko, realizing his earlier attacks, invents the leg knife and, as an eye for an eye goes, takes Tommy Rod's arm. And even this and a leg fort which left several holes in Tommy Rod does not stop him. Realistically, he won this fight and was nowhere near finished, but due to the intervention of Tepai, the little grandson of Knocking Master Jiro, you know, the uh, planet stopper, Tommy Rod tragically loses and is subdued, and once again, even on the verge of defeat, unleashed his ultimate bug, the Parasitic Emperor. With a capture level of 81, it is a creature that nearly kills him on release, and this insect he admits is even ferocious. This is already the strongest beast we've seen in the show so far by capture level. And with scorpion venom, explosive gas, ice breath, silk ensnaring, and massive bladed limbs, this thing alone would be similar to a tailed beast in Naruto. This monster proceeds to battle the strongest creature in Ice Hill, known as the Hell Boros, the ruler of Ice Hill, with a capture level of 72. 
Though it was not stronger than Tommy Rod's Emperor, which had already molted and grown even stronger. This monster battle of titanic proportions led to a bout of destroying the entire continent of Ice Hell. Okay, I'm kind of exaggerating that a little bit, until they're both one hit KO'd by the Gourmet Core elite named Alfaro. Now this is where you might assume the video ends, but nah, we're not doing that around here. Going further, after being rescued by the Gourmet Core, much like Tariko, Tamira goes on to get his arm back and further enhance his abilities in insects, and then participates in the Gourmet Core Siege of the World Cooking Festival, where Tamira Awakened came to blows with one of the less featured Heavenly Kings, Sunny. And in this battle, we get the real damn numbers on how powerful is Tamira. Beginning the battle by releasing a bug with a capture level of 100 that cuts Sonny's hair. Now if you haven't seen my Sonny review, you might not know that Sonny's hair is not average. Being able to support literal tons and reflect millions of tons of pressure and force, Sonny's hair can reflect energy and light based attacks like lasers and appetite energy as well. And during the start of this battle, he had just skewered dozens of Tommy Rod's other high capture level bugs. Tommy Rod not only had bugs capable of sniffing this incredible hair strength but also was yanking them out by the fistful from Sonny's head and honestly beating Sonny's ass. For Sonny to have his hair pulled out is the equivalent to having a tooth ripped out without anesthesia, and he was losing thousands of strands. Tommy Rod dodged the same feelers which are only detectable with ocular enhancement like Tommy Rod's compound eyes or special abilities. These feelers are so fine that Sonny can take over creatures' nervous systems and use their body like puppets, and Tommy Rod could see and dodge these feelers. In terms of bugs, Tommy Rod can lay siege single-handedly with beasts stronger than anything in the Tariko human world and his own fighting strength is on par with so far two of the Heavenly Kings, and I doubt he wouldn't prove a matchup for Coco or Seagull. Bonus fact, he can also harden his wings to be stronger than steel and deflect Sunny's hair spit. And during his fight with Tepe and Ice Hill, we learn his biology is even further like that of an insect, as he has ganglia. Now, I'm not gonna explain this in the most scientific way, but think of insect ganglia as separate nervous control centers in the body all working non-stop to relay information and execute functions. Ganglia are the reason some bugs such as the cockroach can live without a head, or why various body parts will still move even after death. Think of a ganglia as separate brain centers for controlling different body parts. This is why even after Sonny cut his arm off or blew it off, it continued to move with Tommy Rod's will and choked Sonny from behind. And even Tommy Rod's arm was stated to have a capture level of no less than 200, which means his arm would absolutely destroy the entire human government and human world. But as all good villains do, Tommy Rod sadly met his end during the gourmet cooking art, as he was defeated by Sonny when Sonny unleashed his Super Saiyan 3, I mean Satan hair ability, that still barely gave him the win over Tommy Rod. As the first hit, Tommy Rod started adapting and reacting faster to the Satan hair, stating that Sonny was just too clumsy with it. But ultimately, he got baited into a final showdown with Sonny, where he is skewered and devoured by the Satan hair. A truly beautiful end for such an ugly and fascinating villain. Now, having heard all of that, I implore you to find a better master of insects. Tommy Rod not only is an incredibly powerful character from the Tariko universe, having the exact same potential hacks level feats and effects like access to the back channel and blah blah blah, I'm not gonna do that in this video. <laughs> but it's also possibly the most dangerous bug user I've seen in any anime, manga, or bit of fiction. You let me know, you know, maybe down in the comments, because you know, leaving a like on the video really helps us in the algorithm, guys. Anyway, welcome back for more Tariko Unveiled. Per a loyal fan's persistent request, today we're journeying to the ever-expanding continent known as the Wu Jungle, home of the BB Corn, and we're going to identify and determine how powerful is the third and final vice chef of the gourmet core. The journey begins with Tariko receiving a tip from Tom about the BB corn. Along with noticing Terry's docile and honestly adorable care for him, he decides to head to the third largest continent in the human world. With a surface area of 12 million kilometers, Wu Jungle is basically four times larger than Australia and a little smaller than Russia. The Wu Jungle ecosystem is so massive, it holds every single unique ecosystem on the planet within it from tropical jungles to deserts. This ecosystem is so highly pervasive that the jungle landscape changes rapidly with new fauna growing by the second. 
this continent supports predatory plant type monsters that also prey on flesh and even seem adapted to other methods such as ambush and mimicry. Upon Tariko's arrival to the continent, two key things to remember for the video take place. One, Terry takes a bathroom break, and Tariko discovers the peaceful flower. Flowers that when in the presence of predatory creatures, the leaves will wilt and each petal representing 10 capture levels will fall off. Again, remember this, one plant has six total leaves, meaning one plant can represent a total of capture level 60. With that in the back of your mind, we continue. The Wu jungle, while incredibly diverse and a wildlife expert's dream, as I said, contains incredibly dangerous plant life. But as Tariko and Terry barely into the jungle find out, the very nature of the flora and fauna of Wu jungle is dangerous. While walking, almost comically, a bird poops on Tariko's shoulder. While funny, this instantly becomes a life-threatening situation. And that's mainly because the bird's poop contains seeds, and these, upon landing on Tariko's shoulder, instantly begin to take root in his body and sprout a tree. Tariko has to slice off the top portion of his shoulder and once again boo toy animation for censoring this this clearly is not a jungle that you simply want to roam around in these botanical nightmares being the least of their worries as after Tariko and Terry get attacked by a high level plant beast Tariko delivers some stern fathering on how Terry has to think for himself and cause this situation not helping outside of releasing his intimidation Terry, to his credit as a gourmet world creature, adapts by using his intelligence and speed to set the plant beast on fire with a local fruit that produces high-grade alcohol, you know, it's Tariko, so... Literally, setting the beast on fire from the sparks of his attacks and the high alcohol content. I'm actually planning a video on the pets of Tariko as they're all kind of really amazing creatures, especially since each one of them is essentially a baby god, but that's for another day. After breaching the ravenous biodiversity of Wu Jungle, Tariko and Terry make it above the canopy and finally feast their eyes on the BB corn. Tariko initially attempts to cut a large stalk of the corn and has incredible difficulty, stating the plant's fibers are as strong as a GT robot's body, which, by the way, are titanium alloy fibers. Terry then prompts Tariko to notice the literally skyscraper-sized stalk of BB corn in front of them. The BB corn is a legendary ingredient. They only grow in staggering sizes at the top of the mass of canopy of the Wu jungle which happens to have them directly channel all the nutrients they need from below. Tariko's only solution to this was to punch the corn with a five ring Kuji punch to free a kernel. With the ever-changing nature of the jungle they actually get lost but because Terry marked his scent they easily navigate their route back and with haste move towards a local volcano region to turn the kernels into popcorn which is great because you're gonna want your popcorn for this next part braving temperatures of 1200 degrees Tariko and Terry free the delicious fluffy goodness of the BB corn but here's where our story sideways as sudden as the wind something well someone vacuums all the popcorn away and into their mouth introducing the final seuss or vice chef of the gourmet core Grin Potch. Now, we've talked about Starjuin and we've talked about Tommy Rod, but Grin Potch is the one vice chef I never could truly predict what he would do next. Grim Potch's arrival already sets off danger senses in Tariko and Terry, Terry retreating immediately only to get caught by the winds of Grin Potch's breath. Keep in mind, Terry, even as a child, Battle Wolf can hit top speeds of around 100 kilometers or 60 miles -ish per hour. This literally puts Grimpatch's lung capacity and breath strength by extension, tornado level, at 60 to 70 miles per hour winds can uproot trees and cause severe building damage. Grimpatch's tornado like breath gun nearly catches Terry if not for Tariko striking his straw. Honestly, though he wasn't really featured as much as Starjuin or Tommy Rod, Grimpatch is quite literally a specimen of nature. While I'm not certain the additional arms he has are either implants or new growth fueled by his gourmet cells, this along with his spider-like eyes and charcoal black teeth instantly kind of set the premise for their certain level of tension. He already appeared and took Tariko's popcorn, tried to eat his dog, and we can all agree Grimpatch certainly loves food. To the point he vomits up the BB corn and sucks it back up with his straw to eat it again. Grimpatch uses a straw made from the sucker of a devil mosquito, a massive insect beast, and this straw was so durable, Tariko literally couldn't even cut it at the start of their encounter. Grimpatch appeared to be unconcerned about any threat from Tariko, taking the time to have a snack, smoke a cigar, and even have an enlightening chat about the origin of God with Tariko. In this chat, we get a lot of detail on Grimpatch's personality. We see he's rather nonchalant about life, even from his direct orders from the Gourmet Corps. 
Originally, he was sent out to recover the damaged GT robots from the Regal Plateau, but being intercepted by Chief Mantum and Vice President Shigematsu, who was, you know, ultimate traitor, Grimpoch literally said, nah, this doesn't seem worth it, y'all have fun, and proceeded to devour any beast he could find on his way off the island. However, to his credit, he knew he couldn't go back to HQ empty-handed, and he comes to the Wu jungle to acquire the BB coin, the very thing that Tariko and Terry are there for. Even claiming his pet should be on his way with some of the corn now, but has a terrible sense of direction. This chat seems fine and dandy until Grimpotch hits the gas and basically tells Tariko that they're fated to fight anyway, so why not now? As soon as Grimpotch and Tariko launch in a battle, we see the equivalent of a natural disaster as the local birds and rats scatter away from them, sensing the imminent danger. The battle begins with Grimpotch's breath attack and Tariko's tenfold coochie punch clashing. Keep in mind, in the next arc, which is Ice Hell, Tariko's five ring coochie punch shattered a titanic sized iceberg. The attacks cancel each other out, and Grimpotch, being surprisingly tactical, retreats to a distance and literally starts zoning Tariko like it's a fighting game. Grimpotch's breath bullets are so fast and powerful, they hit Tariko like a literal machine gun. Tariko then realizes his flaw in dealing with ranged combatants. This, like his other fights with Vice Chefs of the Gourmet Corps, leads Tariko to literally evolve in mid-combat, inventing the Flying Fork and Flying Knife, all so just he could get close to Grimpotch to even be able to be a threat. As Tariko admits that he still has to be close to have a chance of actually damaging Grimpotch. And these attacks that he did land barely scratch Grimpotch, and we see he has either a healing factor or can somehow seal his wounds with his breath pressure. And even despite the fact that Tariko cuts his straw and the battle starts to get serious, it gets cut short as Grimpotch is called home by the head chef of the Gourmet Corps, and with some comical dialogue about Tariko's popcorn being payback for cutting his straw, Grimpotch's pet Jack arrives, and we understand that Grimpotch never took Tariko seriously during this battle. His pet, the capture level 85 Jack Beetle, casually arrives carrying a skyscraper-sized stalk of BB corn. And Tariko instantly recalls the massive severed stalk that he had saw ahead of him and Terry in the forest. Meaning, the Jack Beetle had already completed its mission before Tariko even got a few corners of the corner. Going further in Grimpatch's power level, we get an incredibly scary sight as he seems to release his killing intent and hunger after the battle. Drooling at the mouth, he complains that he didn't get to eat Tariko's organs or his little puppy upon leaving the Wu jungle. Like this, Grimpatch flies over an entire field of peaceful flowers. Remember those from the beginning? And he kills off every single one of them. Remember, like I said at the start of the video, six petals on each resulting in a capture level of 60. Every flower in sight wilted in Grimpatch's presence. Even in theory, this would automatically put him outwardly at in a capture level of the thousands, in terms of just outright strength, or it could just be the threat he could possibly pose to the ecosystem. As it is also additionally stated, that the sous chefs were all gourmet world capable, not needing to use GT robots, so it makes sense. Wrapping up on Wu Jungle, the next time we see Grimpatch, of course, is during the Gourmet Corps' invasion of the Cooking Festival. Like I said, this arc was so damn good, and as the invasion kicks off, we get more detail on Grimpatch, as he slurps up Coco's poison machine gun attack. We've discussed exactly how dangerous and toxic Coco and his various attacks are, and in this situation, we get to see Grimpatch's body is built like a natural factory, explaining how he can eat entire creatures and basically turn them into soup but it processes break down and even allows him to metabolize Coco's poison. And we saw earlier, once again, he does this to living creatures like Capri Suns. Grimpatch's breath attacks show to have been upgraded from Azide Scale Tornado to Hurricane or even higher level, blowing a hole in the massive, massive city-sized cooking stadium, a hole so deep you couldn't see the bottom of. Being similar to the Four Kings and other Vice Chefs, I'd scale Grimpatch as continental large island level. As stated in the arc, many of the fighters at the festival were capable of destroying the Connecticut-sized island with ease, even after engaging in close combat with Grimpotch, which I don't feel happened in the manga, the anime probably embellished that a little bit. Coco out of options to deal with Grimpatch's, you know, unique ability not to die from poisoning, drops them both into the pit to unleash his devil poison, the highly addictive poison that can subjugate anything. And after a while, we still don't know what happened. Grimpatch is the one who came out of the hole, not Coco. Once again, though, we find out that Grimpatch finally found his favorite meal. 
Coco's devil poison. He was, in a way, turned into a junkie, and Coco is now the dealer. When Coco drops the devil poison nearly on his command, Grandpatch will appear to do his bidding. This being the case for the reunion for the three vice chefs versus the remnants of the gourmet corps. We even get to see Grandpatch has an ability called Worm Breath, meaning he's probably similar to Tommy Rod and has bugs living inside of him. But sadly for our vice chef lovers, Tommy and Grandpatch got melted on contact by Joey's mold spore attack, and and well, that was the end of Grand Potch. While I would have loved a rematch with him and Rico, or even just more than two appearances without the entire, like, fandom, it wasn't meant to be. Either way, that's all, folks. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tariko Unveiled, and remember, we give thanks to the bounty this universe provides.